something to rejoice about knowing that salvation has been brought down to us, that we can have a right to the tree of life and to live with God eternally. We need to quit, uh, quit living like this earth is going to be here forever. Uh, our mindset is set so much on obtaining things and thinking we're going to be here forever. This world will pass away, but God's word will not. And to live with God forever is something we all should be anxiously looking forward to. I don't know about you, but there are days in this life that I just want to say, come Jesus, come quickly. Uh, let's get this done. And let's get this over with. And let's get to the presence of the Lord. How y'all doing today? Everybody good? Blessed by the best? Too blessed to be stressed? Amen. We serve a great God today. And we are privileged and thankful uh, to serve a God like we have. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day in our lives. A day that we have never seen before. And when it is over, we will never see again. Bless us in this day that we can give you all the glory, honor, and praise that you truly deserve. And we are thankful to honor you in this way on your day. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice, and we are glad in it. We're thankful for every day in our lives but especially the Lord's Day, the first day of the week when we come together to worship in spirit and in truth. As your word goes forth today, may it minister to the hearts of thy people that we will receive our due portion in your allotted time, that we will be better having been here than before we came. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy that endureth forever in our lives. We give you glory, honor, and praise through Jesus our Lord. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Want to be real practical with you this morning. Let's talk about a few things that sort of happen to me almost on a daily basis. And I would be cautious to say that you are impacted by these things as well. Just some real practical thoughts that we're going to connect the word of God to. Things that we have conversation with, with other people throughout each day, or at least sometime during our week. It's something that I've been taking notes about a period, over a period of time. Seems fitting to uh, put some scripture to it to bring it to light, not only for me, but for you as well. I'm just so thankful for the God we serve it is through him that we move and have our very being. Everything in our life, we owe to God. Amen. What does that really mean? God seeks a relationship with us. He seeks a relationship for us to truly know him. Not just to know about him, but to know him because there is a difference. It's a difference in knowing about God, that he exists, 
he is sovereign and he reigns. It's quite another to really know who he is. So today, brothers and sisters, let us consecrate ourselves in knowing who God really is. Not about what you know. It's about who you know. God seeks a relationship with us through our hearts. Our hearts. Everything settles in that. We don't speak with our lips. We speak with our heart. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We don't see with our eyes. We see with our heart. We don't speak with our lips. We speak through our heart. Luke 6, 45 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We don't really think with our minds. We think with our hearts. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You see how all of this connects to our heart. It's the heart of the matter or a matter of the heart. It connects us with God in this special way for us to really know him because everything we do to know him comes through our heart. Is that all right with somebody? Today we want to illustrate this more uh, in the life of Paul. Uh, meditation came from Philippians 4 and the sermon will come from Philippians 3. Just turn page, one page back, to the left, to the left, to the left, amen, to chapter 3. And, and, and some of the practical things that, that, that I want to bring forth, uh, we pray will tie into what Paul is sharing with us so we'll know better how to handle those conversations we have on our jobs and in our homes and with our family and friends. Chapter 3. Verse 1, we'll try to get through first five or six verses and then get through, uh, through verses 11 through tonight. In the next couple of weeks, we will continue on and finish up the third chapter, which is a phenomenal set of truths that will bless our hearts. Amen? Uh, Paul is in prison at the times of this writing, the book of Philippians. Uh, during this particular imprisonment, he wrote four books. The book of Philemon, anybody heard of that one? A tremendous chapter that we should spend more time on. Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. If you were to do some extended research, you'd find these listed under the prison epistles because he wrote all four of these in prison. We know that he is in jail at this time. And the book of Philippians has been entitled by some folk as the epistle of joy. He talks about joy and its derivative, rejoicing, often in this book. Somebody can be in jail and still find it in their hearts to find some joy, Mikey Mike, some joy being locked up. Most folk that I have talked to incarcerated struggle with joy because it's not the best place to be in. Paul here encourages folk who are not in jail by the words he speaks 
while he's in jail. Amen, walls and electric lights. And it, it ought to encourage our hearts with the stuff we go through on a daily basis to know that you can find joy outside of things, situations, and circumstances. Because joy is not connected to that stuff. He has to deal with some folk who are trying to discourage God's people. A group of folk called the Judaizers who taught that God's people need to obey the law. Who taught that all men of God need to be circumcised. Because that's the mark of God that God instituted in the book of Leviticus. Okay. And there were some folk called the Gnostics who taught about you just need to know a lot of stuff. And, and, and if you know about all things, the more you know, the closer you're going to be to God. Knowledge. A lot of folk today think that's all they need is just to how to know a lot of stuff. A group called the mystics who taught about angelic beings and where, where Christ fit in on that angelic ladder. Ascetics who taught about what you could eat and what you couldn't eat. And Peter says, after he met with the household of Cornelius, uh, you can eat whatever you want to now. Nothing wrong with that fat back and hog malls and things anymore. It used to be a time when you couldn't eat that. Eat whatever you want as long as you pray about it and give thanks. So these people will have infiltrated. Here's what would happen. Paul would preach, establish the churches, and once he left, these folk would follow behind him and then teach these doctrines. Okay? Some things that he would teach about, they would counter. So they would say, Paul would say, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We're under the law of grace now. They would come back and say, oh no, you still need circumcision. You still need to follow the law. And the book of Galatians is filled with the first five chapters trying to deal with this problem. Galatians was a region. Philippi is a city. So they dominated this place. Well, Paul was in jail, so he has to write this letter to encourage the Philippian Christians who many were young in the faith and new converts and were being tossed and turned to and fro so the letter is designed to encourage them through this teaching that has been taking place. Alright? So in verse 1, chapter 3, Finally, or therefore, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, there are a lot of things we can get happy about, but Paul says, be sure to rejoice in the Lord. Not rejoice in Ohio State, or Clemson, Georgia, the Browns, the Steelers, don't rejoice in them. Yeah, you get some joy or something when they win the game and, and, and you cheer about people that you don't even know and you get all excited about that. But he says rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious to me, but is... For you, it is safe. Let me talk about joy for a second. Talks about it in verse chapter 1, verse 4. We're taking notes. Chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Chapter 4, verse 4. And chapter 4, verse 10, and here in chapter 3, 
verse 1. He didn't say happy. He said joy. See, happy comes from the root word hap, which talks about circumstance, event, situations. In other words, depending on how the situation turns out, will determine if I'm going to be happy or not. Okay. Happenstance, a happening, same root word. Happiness is an emotion associated with an event or a situation. It's situation oriented. It's a happening, but it's not a relationship. Joy connects to relationship. That's why he says rejoice in the Lord. When I have joy in my relationship, it's one of trust. I trust the sovereign God because no matter what happens in my situation, in my event, or circumstance, I know that my life is in the hand of a sovereign God, and he knows what he's doing. I trust him. I have a quietness of life because I trust in God. I still have joy. I still have joy after all the things I've been through. I still have joy. Regardless of the circumstance, the event or the situation, I still have joy. I still have peace. I still have peace after all the things I've been through. I still have peace because it's not connected to situations, event, or circumstances. It is connected to the relationship I have with God. So Paul says rejoice in the Lord. It's a melody in the heart despite what's going on in the world. It persists even in the loss of everything I have because it's, it's, it's well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Joy is the relationship. Why? Because Jesus is always there. And we trust him. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Uh, no matter where I'm at, the Lord is there. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So there's no reason to fear. Amen? So he says, I have to re repeat some things for you. It, it's not tedious to me, and hopefully it's not tedious to you, but I need you to know this for it is for, it is for your own good, for, it is for your own safety. The parents want to tell kids, all the time. They repeat things because they want you to know, young folk, it's for your own good. It's for your safety. And I know you respond, Mama, it's agonizing. You, you, you just, all, you know, annoying. You get, why do we got to keep talking about the same thing? Because it's for your safety. It's for your own good. And that word has to do with something that is designed to trip you, cause you to fall, cause you to fail, cause you to be overthrown. Paul says, we, we can't have this. I need you to know. Verse 2, beware of dogs. The Bible talks about dogs in two ways. In Matthew 15, 26 and 27, it makes reference to a dog being a pet. Some of y'all got a dog at home, or maybe one or two or three. Okay. Marquis sees dogs every day because he has to deliver mail. And some of the dogs are pets. 
but some of them want to eat him alive. And that's when the Bible talks about the other word for dogs. These are ravaging dogs, roams in packs, pillage through the community, strike fear in people, designed to run the streets. Marquis told me a story. A little chihuahua came chasing at him, and he maced him. The next day, the little chihuahua came back, but he had two pet bulls next to him. <laughs> and Marquise ran on that porch so quick, called his supervisor and said, come get me. Them dogs are trying to get here. Little chihuahua came back with some help. He didn't come back with any dog, pet bulls. Marquise knew good enough to get up out the way. Don't mess with them things. Well, these dogs in the Bible were like that. And you remember the parable, the story of, of, of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16. And Lazarus was a poor beggar who yearned for the crumbs from the table of the rich man, he was a sickly beggar, was Lazarus. Homeless in the streets. And the Bible says in verse 21 that the dogs came and licked his sores. And then Lazarus died, and you know the story of the great Gulf fix. It's one thing for Jews to call Gentiles dogs, and that's what they did, to scorn them and to put them down and to make them feel less than. It's another thing when a Jew calls another Jew a dog. And Paul says, these guys are dogs. Beware, why? Because they want to destroy you. They want to cause you to fall, they want to confuse you, they want to hurt you, they are evil workers, and all they want to do is follow rituals, rules, and customs. This circumcision business. Paul says they are the mutilation. Walking around with knives, wanting to cut the foreskin off, okay? And in Galatians, Paul says, you guys are evil and you are wrong. And you just want to cut, you might as well cut the whole thing off because what you're teaching has no benefit. So he said they are just the workers of the mutilation. All they want to do is cut. And I'm going to keep it moving from that but that's what they did you want the reference is Galatians 5 1 through 6 circumcision Paul says in verse 3 we are the true circumcision because in God's mind it was always always his plan to not be caught up in the circumcision of the flesh but the circumcision of the heart cut that foolishness out of your heart. But we so hung up on the outer flesh because the true people of God are the ones who have a circumcision of the heart. And it gives us three reasons for that. Look at verse three. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. That's number one. You know the child of God, the people of God, because they, first of all, worship God in spirit. And we would say in spirit and in truth. And we would say there are folk who are religious, but they're not righteous. The second thing, to rejoice in Christ. You see that in verse 3? And we've talked about that already. And to have no confidence in the flesh. When God's people focuses on these three things, 
you know that they are set apart, they are sanctified because of the focus of their life. They worship God the right way. They rejoice in Christ Jesus. And they have no confidence in the flesh. You're dependent on your flesh to help you through life. You're going to make all the wrong decisions because the flesh has no communion with the spirit and it's going to be a conflict and you're going to be out of the will of God. Don't count on flesh to help you through what God wants to lead you through. So he says, don't, 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 don't do that in this way. Rituals, customs, and ceremonies. Paul had observed all his life. He, 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 he talks about verse 4 that I also might have a confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I the more so. If anybody could have confidence in the flesh, it's me. Okay. He went to the third heaven and came back to talk about it. And nobody else had that opportunity. Okay. And now he's going to talk about some things that are absolutely amazing. And, 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 and I need you to hang in there. He says, I, if anybody, could have confidence in the flesh. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Anybody know about customs? Anybody knows about ceremonies? Anybody knows about rituals? It's me. I was circumcised on the day I was supposed to be. Ishmael was circumcised when he was 13. Genesis 17, 25. But not me. Because me and my family did all the rituals like we were supposed to. And I want to share with you this morning, salvation is not found in rituals, in customs, and in ceremonies. Paul said in verse number seven, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. It's important for me to have done these, but now that I realize what it means now, it ain't nothing. And when you get people talking to you about what they do and how they do it and how they observe it and expect you to know that because they do that, they're more religious than you are, that they're closer to God than you are, understand customs, rituals have no place in salvation. Salvation is not tied to any of those things. Colossians 2 and verse 16 says this. Let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival or new moons or Sabbaths or any of that other stuff. The Roman Catholics have this ritual called a penance, where, where it's designed to, 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 for God to forgive them of all their sins and to make them think they're more closer to God than anybody else. One of my coaching colleagues is a Muslim. And, and three times a day he prays. And he prays at 6 o'clock every day when we have practice, when we have a game, he disappears. He'll find somewhere to go. So what, what coach at? Oh, you know, it's 6 o'clock. He's gone. 
and he kisses the ground, raises his hands, and pray to Allah. Ritual. The kids be like, Coach Smith, how many times you pray a day? So I don't know how many times I pray. I pray all, I pray all day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I just do that. I pray all day. Because the Bible says I need to pray without ceasing. Okay? And, you know, and they don't know the Bible, but they say, good looking, Coach. Good looking. Good looking, Coach. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Rituals don't make you closer. Don't let anybody judge you or make you feel bad because you ain't on your knees at 6 o'clock every day. You need to be praying all through the day. He says that I am of the stock of Israel. It says in Romans 9.3, ain't nobody true, or true Israel than me. You want to find an Israelite, all you got to do is look at me. Some Jews could trace their heritage through Abraham and Ishmael. They could do that. The Ishmaelites aren't the children of Isaac. So I want some Jews that could trace their heritage through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And some could just trace their heritage through Abraham and Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. That wasn't a trick question class. Jacob and Esau, who many believe is the father of the Idiomanites, who are the Arabs of today. Okay? There are those who could claim their heritage through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the people who claim to be the, the true Jew, the true Jewish bloodlines. And I just want you to know today that race has nothing to do with your salvation. Doesn't matter what race you are. Paul said, I'm a true Israelite because of my heritage. A couple years ago, uh, we left class on a Saturday, I went up to McDonald's. That was before I was on a restricted diet. Okay. And I ran into some people who called themselves the Black Hebrews. They were on 105th Street with a megaphone. Did anybody run into them people? Okay, so I'm, I'm not the only one. I believe, I believe UConn and I believe Brother Allen ran into him at some point as well. They want to talk to me about they was true Israel. We're the true God, children of God. We're black Hebrews. Yeah. We want to have a Bible study. And, and they had the megaphones pulling people aside, giving them tracts. So I went over there. And they want to... Hey, we, wanna, we want Brother David to sit down with you and have a Bible study. I said, when does he have Bible studies? Every evening. I said, good. He said, where do you live at? I said, well, that's not where I live at, but you can find me on Wednesdays and Thursday nights at 8837 St. Clair, right down the street. At 7 o'clock. Matter of fact, I'll have some of my people with me. He just come on in. And we can have a good old Bible study. Any night you want, we'll be there. Oh, I'll let Brother David know. And Brother David never showed up. <laughs> but they were preaching 
to all the people that were listening. And especially folk who sometimes don't always feel the best about themselves wanted to enhance their self-esteem. Look, you ain't got to be all down like that. You're a true child of God. Because if you're a black Hebrew, God has respect for you more than anybody else. Quit being depressed and, and, and having low self-esteem. They were talking about all that stuff. God doesn't care what race you are. Whosoever will, let him come. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who should ever believe in him should not perish. That whosoever involves everybody have everlasting life. And they were promoting this doctrine. Paul says, I'm not only a true Israelite, I, I can trace my ancestry back. He says, I, I'm a Benjaminite. Y'all see that in the text? You see that? I'm a tribe of Benjamin. Who are these people? Can we just have a Bible study? Is that all right with y'all? Okay. Who are the Benjaminites? Benjaminites were an elite tribe of Israel. There were 12. Benjamin was one. Who is Benjamin? Who was he? He was born to Israel's favorite mother. Israel's favorite mother was Rachel. Why was she Israel's favorite mother? Because Jacob called her his favorite wife. And so, her descendants, the children she bore, received a special recognition amongst the people. Judah and Benjamin. Okay. If Judah is number one, it's the lineage in which Christ came through, amen, then Judah, or Benjamin, would then would be 1A. Okay. Rachel died bearing Benjamin. She died giving him birth. Genesis 35, verses 9 and following. This tribe was given a unique military Honor and priority. Judges 5, verse 14. Hosea 5, verse 8. Uh, they were tremendous warriors, and they have led from the front whenever there was battle. Uh, when Israel wanted a king, they went to the tribe of Benjamin because King Saul was a Benjamin knight. Okay? When God divided up the lands in the promised land, Benjamin got the portion that Jerusalem was connected to, and Jerusalem eventually became what? The holy city of God. Are y'all with me? Okay. That's in Judges 1, verse 21. Ezra chapter 4, verse 1 records that it was Benjamin and Judah that organized and mobilized the people when they came out of Babylonian captivity, but Benjamin was the lead tribe in that organization. Okay? You will find that in Ezra chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Kings 12 and 21, when the kingdom divided after Solomon, okay? Benjamin stayed loyal to the Davidic dynasty and stayed with Judah to form the southern kingdom while the other tribes went up to the north in rebellion and eventually never heard from again. In the book of Esther, it's a man named Mordecai. Anybody heard of Mordecai? Mordecai became the foster father to Esther. But bloodlines, they were first cousins. Okay? You remember Mordecai saved the king's life. And it was recorded in the king's law. And the king couldn't sleep one night. And his bear, cut bear brought the history book to him. And the book happened to open on the page that 
Mordecai was recorded in having saved the king's life. Okay? Haman, anybody heard of Haman, who wanted to destroy the entire tribe, set up gallows to hang them on. But because Mordecai had saved the king's life, the king then gave homage to Mordecai instead of Haman, and the very gallows that Haman built to hang Mordecai and the Jews, he wound up dying from himself. Okay. City, 2 Kings 16, 2 Samuel 16, and chapter 19 as well, it's a guy named Sini. He was a Benjaminite, but he was an idiot. Okay? He was throwing rocks at David. Now, if you're going to pick a fight with David, you don't want to pick up rocks. Okay? Because all you got to do is ask Goliath what David could do with a rock. And he throwing rocks at David. He's an idiot. He later repented, but it didn't clear the fact that he was an idiot. All of Judah's history is not pleasant. You'll find in the book of Judges, chapter 19 and chapter 20, several Benjaminite men who gang raped a woman. She died from the experience. Her body was cut up in pieces, Shannon and sent to all the rest of the tribes of Israel. And because of that, 25,100 Benjaminites were massacred, okay? So all of the history isn't good. But when you look at those things and there are other things that I could share with you, this tribe was a phenomenal tribe. Paul says, I am a Benjaminite. But he realizes that all of that is lost too, that I might gain Christ. That is not important anymore. Now, your salvation is not tied into who your people are. You're not going to stand in front of Jesus and say, Jesus, don't you know who my daddy is? You don't know who my mama is, Jesus. Ain't had nothing to do with you being saved. Don't let anybody tell you that if you're not a certain ancestry, certain race, obeying certain rituals and customs, you have no closeness or no salvation in God because it is not true. Paul says, all of this stuff that I could talk about I can have confidence in the flesh because ain't nobody bad like me. But all of that is lost. It doesn't matter. God is not impressed with who your mama is. He's not impressed with what you have accomplished in life. That doesn't matter to God. It's not what you have or what you know is who you know. When you know God, that is the most important thing that you can do in this life because Paul, who could tell you everything about who he is, who he was, realized that that stuff is garbage. Folks spend their lives trying to accomplish all of this stuff. And at the end of the day, Paul said, is rubbish, is garbage. Some translations say is dung. What is dung? What's the good word I can say for dung? Excrement? Ain't nobody know what that is. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. It's manure. Is that better? Is that better? Your salvation ain't tied into all of those things, custom mores, 
Stuff makes people religious, but it doesn't make them righteous. Can I get you to turn to Matthew real quick? Matthew chapter 15. Verse, we'll start at 6 for, for time. Matthew 15, 6. And the B part of the verse, that they have made the commandments of God of no effect. Why? By your traditions. You see that? You, when you focus on all that stuff, then you don't have a, you don't you don't have an opportunity or time to focus on really what God has to say, because all your energy and time is tied up in the following a ritual at a certain time of the day, a custom, a ceremony. And Jesus says you have made the commandments of law to, to of God of no effect by your traditions. He says you are none but a bunch of hypocrites that Isaiah prophesied about. Don't allow that stuff to cause you to feel like there's something you have to do to be closer to God. By the time in his writing of the Philippians, most Jews couldn't trace back their ancestry because the records had been destroyed in the Babylonian captivity. Okay? And also in the intermarriage, bloodlines were diluted because of intermarrying with others. But Paul says, not me. It happened to me. Because I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. My mom and daddy ain't messing around like that. My people didn't play that. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning my heritage, who my people are. Paul says, ah, oh, your salvation is not tied in ancestry. God is not impressed with what you have in your life. Because he says in verse number 8, Philippians 3, Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Okay? Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them to be as rubbish, garbage, that I might what? Gain Christ. I gain Christ not through any and all of those things. Paul was a true Hebrew. Many of the Jews became Hellenistic, which means they adopted and assimilated into Greek culture. It was Jews who could speak the Greek language. Everybody went to the Greek schools because that was where the great knowledge was being taught. Aristotle, Socrates, you heard of those people? Okay, even the Romans sent their children to the Greek schools. Okay, in Acts chapter 6, we come across a group of Hellenistic Jews whose wills were being neglected in Acts chapter 6. They came to the apostles and said, our widows are not being served. Can you do something about it? And the apostles said, we, we, we've got to spend our time more in the word, but we'll appoint some men full of the Holy Spirit to take care of your people. Stephen, Philip, and some others were appointed. But Paul says, throughout all of that, my people never relented from the Hebrew faith. Acts 21.40. Can you turn there? Don't lose Philippians. Let me get you a couple things. Acts 21.40. Give us the 
is the right focus. Paul. Talks about the fact that it says so when he had given him permission, Paul stood in the stairs and and motioned with his hand to all the people. And when they were a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. Paul could speak Hebrew fluently. Okay, he could speak Hebrew fluently. As a child of Hebrew parents, as I've talked to you about, but Acts 22 verse 3 gives us that scripture. Acts 22 3. For I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus, Galatia, but brought up in the city at the feet of Gamal and taught according to the strictest of our fathers in the law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. And in Acts 26, verse 4, and we'll tie this together, Acts 26, verse 4 and 5, my manner of life from my youth, I want you to get that, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem. I've been a Jew all my life, and and, 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 and and, and my Jewishness has not been tainted. Okay? Right? All my life, the beginning among our own nation in Jerusalem, and all the Jews know. All the Jews know me. All the Jews know my people. All the Jews know my mom and dad. I'm known by all of the Jews. Popularity might win you homecoming queen, but popularity won't get you into heaven. Regardless of who you know and who knows you, it has nothing to do with your salvation. Paul says, everybody know me. They know my people. They know I'm a Jew, true and true. But when it comes to God and my relationship with him, none of that stuff matters. God doesn't care. He has no and my, he's not bothered by the fact that your salvation connected to how much language you know, who your parents are, and how popular you are. It's not about who you know. It's about if you know God. God made you. It's no concern to him what you look like because he made you. God wants you to love yourself because he first loved you. You may not like the way you look. You may not like about how many friends you have. You may not like your life as a whole. But if you can do this one thing, is to love God. All the things that you don't like will become things that you will love because God will show you how to love yourself and everything connected to you. Okay? And there are so many people who don't love themselves because of things. They're not happy because their, their happiness is tied into the event, the situation, things ain't working out for me. But when you have joy, after all the things you've been through, you still have joy. And joy will get you through those times when you don't feel 
like you're worth anything. They're folk who are religious, 